introduction to poetry. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light, like a color slide, or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into the poem and watch him probe his way out. Or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Why I started off with that poem, Introduction to Poetry, is that in a sense, we're all here to learn about poetry and to learn what speaks to us. And you may hear a poem that just think, ah, oh, that's it. That's why I, I love poetry. So here we are. We're going to have an introduction to poetry from two fabulous poets today. Um, the very first poet that is going to um, lead us today is a, an enormously talented lady. Puno Selesho is a Pretoria-based -based poet. She's a writer and a weaver of beautiful conversations. She's a thought leader, a voiceover artist, and a strategist, and very much more. And she brings her own commitment to, to knowing who she is, what she's about, and how she wants to communicate that through her poetry. Uh, it's been a delight to, to meet her and to, to introduce her to you. So, Puno, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Liesl. Um, Hello, girls. Hello, everybody. Hello to the like one, two, three guys that we have in the room. Um, what a beautiful introduction um, and what a beautiful time that I get to spend with you guys. I really would not be doing anything else with my afternoon. So this is just good and refreshing. And I also want to introduce myself to you with a short introductory poem before I launch into the presentation. So sit back, relax and enjoy. I am Puno, Puno the poet. I invite you to understand my words and me. I've been told that I should have been born bitter and angry, but I say no. My words are birthed from the soil in my own chest. People keep digging graves with every phrase, but I'm planting flowers instead. I am not angry. I am brave. I am not abrasive. I am determined. And I will work these words and toil the soil until the joy in my bones grows here. This tongue is sharp and I will shape my own exceptional reality using only the finest materials like hope and humanity. What will your words be? Choose wisely and let's use words that grow well here in South Africa. So that is a poem just to introduce myself to you guys. As has been said, my name is Bruno Silisho and I'm a poet. And I am going to be spending the next 40 minutes with you, introducing you to my world of poetry, what I do, how I do it, why I do it. And what my, my hope and my prayer for you guys at the end of this is that you guys walk away with some tools that you can use poetry for the same things, whether it's one thing or all of the many things that I'm going to share. Um, it's, it's me imparting myself as a gift to you you guys. As you heard in my first poem, which is called Words That Grow, I use poetry to, to shape words and to shape worlds that look like hope, that sound like hope, that give hope to people, especially now as we've been in trying times um, during COVID for the past, I don't know, has it been 18 months? Um, we all need a little bit of hope. We've all lost something. Some people have lost people. Other people have lost jobs. Some of us have just lost our way of living, the world as we know it. 
we keep talking about the new normal. So it is necessary to introduce people to the concept of hope. Um, and that is the, the gift that I'm going to be giving to you guys. So cool. If you guys are ready and happy, please feel free to add things in the comments. Tell me how you are. How are you feeling? Tell me what you want to get out of this workshop specifically. Um, would love to see that in the comments. Um, I'm going to start presenting my presentation now. Um, and Lisa, I'm going to ask that when I reach my five minutes left sort of marker, please see know me um so let it go don't yap on and on and on and on <laughs> um if everybody can see that just let me know if you can't and i'm gonna get ready to get stuck in immediately so are we all good we can see that unmute and let me know if you can't Cool beans. If we're good to go, let's do this. So thank you again to the Avva Poetry Project for having me um, and giving me the opportunity to spend this time with the girls. Um, absolutely one of my favorite things to do is just hang out with the ladies. So we're going to be doing a spoken word workshop. So we are going to be writing. We are going to be doing a little bit of reading. We are going to be doing a little bit of workshopping and learning. I'm a teacher at heart. I'm pretty sure that if I didn't study law, I would have studied teaching at some level. Um, so we are going to be learning but this is not a classroom environment so get comfortable get cozy and let's keep up so how did poetry find me and how did i find poetry well the first poem that i ever remember writing was when i think i was probably like in grade four or something like that so i was really little um and it was mother's day like the mother's day that we just had now now and my church was running a poetry competition um and i wrote a poem for my mom i remember it was one of those like two rhyming couplets, two rhyming couplets, so cat sat on the hat kind of style. It wasn't anything phenomenal. Um, but I came second in the competition. Um, and my mom and I got like this little like milkshake voucher or book prize or something small like that. But for me, it was massive. I was like, whoa, I got to like, recognize this random thing. And I actually remember getting a telephone call on like the telephone, you know, the one with like the wire <laughs> telling me that I actually won this competition. Um, and it was one of the most amazing moments for me. And from then on, I didn't really write poetry again until I started realizing in around grade nine that most of my journal entries, because I was one of those like dear diary kind of girls, um, because yeah, I used to watch like the, the Lizzie McGuire's and the, I don't know, was it Hannah Montana back then or whatever it was. Um, and they used to write in their diaries, these girls that I'd see on TV. Um, so I wrote in my diary as well. And most of my entries started sounding like poetry. I liked playing with words and images. And when I was trying to describe my experience or my emotions, I'd use imagery and metaphors and similes, not knowing that that's what they were called. Um, and eventually I started to realize that this is, this is poetry. I'm a poet. Um, and the first time I ever performed my poetry out loud was in grade 10 for a, a concert. There was a, a talent show at school and I, I had this image of like, oh, it would be so cool. There's like a ballerina and a musician and somebody doing poetry. And I searched the internet high and low for any poem that could be good. And I didn't find anything that I liked. So I was like, hey, eh, I'm just going to do it myself. And I did. And I haven't looked back since. Um, so officially, I have been a poet for 11 years. And now this is my main profession. I'm a freelancer, so I do copywriting, I do voiceovers, I do a bunch of things. But being a poet is the main thing that I am known for. So I would like to believe, as you can see on the screen, that I didn't find poetry. Poetry found me. And the gift of words, it is something amazing. But why does this matter to you? Why is this important for you to know? What can poetry do to serve you? Because I'm pretty sure you guys use poetry in the classroom, you do your English, you guys are probably learning iambic pentameter, you've done all of the things, Shakespeare, bored out of your minds. So why is it relevant? Um, and this is what I think you guys can be using poetry for. So the purpose of poetry, first and foremost, is to process in your secret place, in your room, um, whether it's in your diary, on your phone, on your tablet, wherever you are. There's been so much happening in the world and there's a lot of influx of information that we get whether it's on social media, whether it's through our family stuff, our friends, and sometimes our emotions and our hormones as ladies, we know that every month sometimes our hormones go a bit crazy, that we need to process this, we need to understand what's happening, we need to understand ourselves, we need to understand the world. Poetry is a beautiful way for you to actually take some time, sit 
and process things. You can actually figure out um, what your emotions are. Like, cool, if I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling like there's a great crowd, cloud around me, why am I feeling like that? When was the last time I felt happy before the gray cloud? Okay, what is causing it? Okay, how do I want to move it? And by using that process of poetry, you get to process and understand yourself. So you don't feel overwhelmed by emotion. You don't feel overwhelmed by the world. And also you can communicate yourself better. You can communicate yourself to your friends, to your family. When they say, what's up? Why are you happy? Why are you sad? Why are you like this? Or what do you want? What do you need? You've gone through a process where you've put pen to paper and helped yourself understand so you can communicate yourself and you're not overwhelmed. This is the kind of poetry that doesn't necessarily show itself to other people. You don't necessarily um, show it to, to your friends or whatever, but it is for you and it is for you to cultivate. The second thing that we use poetry for is to express ourselves, whether it's to express our culture, to express our personality, to express our views. Um, something that's amazing about poetry is that it, it, there's a way of connecting human to human, person to person. So if we are expressing something that we feel strongly about, when we do it in a poem, it's easier to, to help another person understand it. It's easier to get a message across because there's entertainment and there's pleasure in it. it it's also easier to express difficult things and have difficult conversations. But it's also easy to be creative and show off our creative side. Um, and this is one of the things I love doing, playing around with my sassy side, playing around with my soft, gentle side, and all of these things. It is is a way of showing myself to the world. Um, you can do alongside of it is things like, you know, when you you dress in a specific outfit. Outfits are a way of where we express ourselves, whether it's the colors, whether it's the shape, whether it's, you know, the different styles. That is a way we show this is who I am and we play around with colors and words and things like that. So then another purpose of poetry is to express. So this is one of my favorite ones. The purpose of poetry is to teach. Whether you are teaching yourself something, whether you're teaching another person something, whether you're being taught whatever. So for instance, another, one thing I love to teach people about is teaching them about my culture, teaching them about where I'm from so they can understand me, so that they can understand my role in the world and also allowing other people to teach me that. It's like... I want you to picture yourself studying for an exam for school. Sometimes it's really difficult to remember all of the concepts that we have at school, um, and it takes hours and hours and hours. But the moment you play a Beyonce song, <laughs> you play it like 10 times. By the 10th time, you know that song easily. So using words in a very creative manner helps us to actually remember easier because our brains actually work really well with creative rhythms. It works really well with these creative tools and metaphors and all of the sounds that we hear. So it's easy for us to retain knowledge, to retain information. But again, when you're teaching somebody something, it stops just being head knowledge and it actually becomes heart knowledge. So you connect with people's hearts, you connect with people's emotions and you teach them skills and tools that will last them a lifetime. So maybe there are teachers in the house, maybe they are, you want to communicate something to people. You can use poetry as a tool, whether it's written poetry or spoken poetry, you can actually do that for yourself. Now, I want you to look at this slide. To break, you can see that there's fire, there is something being broken down. And I also want you to look at this side, there's also fire, but it looks like the person is, I don't know whether they're welding or whatever, I'm not much of a builder, I don't usually use my hands, but this person is making something. But both of them have elements of fire, one is breaking and one is building. So why I want to emphasize this is for you to understand that in equipping you with words, in equipping you with this tool of poetry, you have a responsibility because words are powerful. And with great power comes great responsibility. Words, the exact same words that we have, the same dictionary with all of the, what, 26 letters that we have in alphabet that we all have access to, can either break or they can build. And there is a time and a place for both. We've seen in past great speeches by great people where they've spoken against um, injustices in the world or they've spoken against things that are the, the evils in the world that are not good. 
they've used their words, they've used their rhetoric to break down systems or thinking or, you know, beliefs or whatever that are harmful to humanity. They are breaking them down and there is a good place for that. But there's also a space where we need to build, where we speak hopeful things to one another, where we build one another up. As girls, we're really good at that. We're really good at giving each other compliments and saying, girl, you're to me, your hair looks so great. Or, oh, that outfit, girl, you're on sleek, you're dripping. I don't know what Gen Z, Gen Z says these days. But why I say all of this is I want you to be careful as to the words that you use, the poems that you write, even the conversations that you have between one another. What is the purpose of your speech? Be intentional about it. Are you breaking or are you building? And remember that when doing the, the right thing at the wrong time, it can be destructive. If you are breaking and you end up breaking somebody down, you break, up, break down their self-esteem. If you're attacking, if you are, you know, you're trying to express yourself like we see in this one, but it actually ends up breaking somebody down, then we're not using the words properly. Then we're actually being irresponsible. So remember, like I said, with great power comes great responsibility. So be mindful as to, are you breaking with your words or are you building? And remember, there is a time and place for both, but you have to be intentional about it and be purposeful with what you're doing. Another thing about poetry and in along lines with the, the, the building and the breaking, understand that when a song comes on the radio or even on your, I don't know if you guys listen to radio anymore, if it's on Spotify or YouTube music or Apple music or whatever, when that song comes on, I don't know what you guys are listening to at the, the moment, like, I don't know, you're not listening to Erica Badu, I know, Miley Cyrus, <laughs> when Miley Cyrus comes on or Beyonce or whoever, they don't have to ask permission to access your thoughts or to access your emotions or to access your heart. They just automatically have access to those parts of you because that's the power of music, that's the power of words, that's the power of art. And the same thing with you. When you're speaking to somebody, when you are creating, when you are performing your poem or saying your poem, you have immediate access to somebody's soul, to their mind, to their emotions. And why I tell you this is to say, be careful, be mindful, treat it gently, be respectful, um, have good responsibility and cares you have to other people. Use words that build, use words that encourage, use words that help people. And yes, you're allowed to still speak truth. You're allowed to still speak your own truth as long as it's done intentionally and done well. And even with yourself, be careful with the kinds of poetry and words and music you allow into your life, into your mind, into your soul and ask, is this breaking me or is this building me? Is this teaching me? Is it somebody expressing themselves? And if it's them expressing themselves, what am I learning about them? How is this helping me in my walk? Or is it just them processing things out loud? And knowing all of this helps you guide your creative process. And it also helps you understand how to interact with other people and how to interact with their work. So you know, where do I set boundaries? Where am I free to explore? What is good? What do I like? What don't I like? Um, because you have the power to do that. I think that's something I struggled with for years. I didn't call myself a poet right from the get-go because I didn't think I was deserving of that title. I felt like somebody had to look at my work and approve it and say, this is good enough to be considered a poem. I didn't know whether the structure fits. I didn't write in the very, you know, like specific set structure as we learned at school. I just wrote in a way that flowed for me. Until I realized that poetry as a concept is so open and so inclusive that it allows anyone to take hold of it if you are willing. If you are willing to take the invitation that poetry gives out to you, you are allowed to call your po yourself a poet if you want to. If you want to be a poet, whatever style, whatever structure, whatever creative path you're on, you're allowed to call yourself that and be confident in that. Um, so at any moment when you're ready, please feel free to take on the title of poet um, and walk forward with it in confidence.
So let's say um, my sister and I are having an argument and I have noticed that there's something in my sister's behavior that I don't necessarily enjoy and I feel like it's very hurtful. I can choose from the beginning to be like, what does success look like at the end of this conversation with her? And let's say I want to write a poem about it to help her understand where I'm coming from and what I'm experiencing. For me, I can be like, success looks like her understanding that her behavior, maybe my sister gossips about me, her behavior is hurtful towards me. So I can write a poem that sort of addresses her behavior by breaking the behavior down by saying, I don't like the fact that you gossip. Gossiping is bad. This is the result of gossip, all of these things. And what I feel when you gossip about me hurts me and makes me feel small, et cetera. But then I can also say success looks like us leaving that conversation, her being built up to say, even though you treat me like this, you're still my sister. I still love you. I know you're actually a kind person. I know you're better than this. So can you please use your words that are in alignment with the character of yours that I know? So we need to be careful not to break people down, but to break maybe their behavior down, maybe social thinking, maybe, you know, problematic stuff that they might say or, or do. But we just need to be intentional before we write the poem, be like, what does success look like for me in this engagement? Um, so it's about taking a step back before you say things or write things and deciding what you want to do. Um, I hope that answers your question, Trini. No poetry journey is a lifelong journey. Mm. And it's not something you have to get right this week, this year. Think of yourself as being a poet for the rest of your days, and it's going to inform the, the poems you read, the poems you allow into yourself, as Puno said, be mindful. If something distresses you and disturbs you, you know, you, you don't have to keep going back to it and, 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 and taking it in. At some point you may want to say, well, why and how am I going to respond to this? Or am I going to write my poem in response to this distress or whatever it is? But it's not something, and don't, it's not a horse race. Mm. Not like a, a high jump. You can jump higher than the next girl or, you know, you can score more goals in netball. Poetry is an unfolding organic process that's going to last your whole life. Yeah. If, you, if you take that as your goal, that it's going to enrich your days until you, until you die, you know, and, and it can really make your life worth living. 100%, 100%. And I like that, that it's a lifelong thing because there, there have been times when I've had fears like, yo, what if I never write a poem again? Like, what if it's it? Like, what if the words never like refill? And they do because it's almost like a like an ever flowing spring within you. The words, the creativity, the inspiration will always come. You just need to keep cultivating it. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. I want to introduce you to the concept of hope in a way that you may not have heard it before. When we think of hope, we think maybe of optimism of like, oh, we hope that something good happens. We wish something good happens. But hope actually has a bit of a formula. There are three elements to hope. The first element of hope is having a goal, saying, I desire that specific thing to happen. The second element of hope is having pathways. How is that thing going to happen? What is the way in which I'm going to ensure or put my effort and energy to make sure that thing happens? And the last thing is agency, believing that I have the power within myself to make that thing happen. And people need hope. Without hope, we perish. Without hope, the heart grows sick. Without hope, we fall into literally hopeless, helpless. And it's be it becomes harder to wake up. It becomes harder to do life. It becomes harder to enjoy anything. So my encouragement is to be like, now that we've lost these things, how can we hold on to hope again? What is the goal? Would you like to get your joy back again? Would you like to create again? Would you like to strengthen your relationship with your sister or your grandmother, or whoever again? Maybe that's your goal. And you believe that you can do it, that you can achieve that, that even though you've lost certain things, you are able to come out of it. And then think, how am I going to get there? What do I need to do to achieve that thing? Viewing hope in this way 
is practical, it's empowering, and it doesn't leave it to chance. And hope is something we all need in the country. We see a lot of things happening around us, whether it's politically or socially. There's a lot of injustice, there's a lot of poverty because people have lost hope. They've lost the idea that good can come, that good is possible, that they are worthy of good things, that other people wish good for them. And this idea of hope can kind of restore it. And nobody has to give you permission to do this. It is something you just are able to choose and do for yourself. How I did this for myself during lockdown is that I wrote, remember we had 21 days of hard lockdown? I wrote one poem a day for 21 days in the 21 days of lockdown. Why? Because I said at the end of these 21 days, I do not want to come on the other side of it feeling depressed or feeling sad or hopeless or feeling like I've lost control. I had a lot of jobs canceled in that time. I moved back in with my parents. We all lost the sense of security and safety and well-being. And it was hard. It was tough. It was really 21 days of hard lockdown. But my goal was to end that 21 days with a sense of hope, positivity, feeling like good things could still happen in the world. And that the pathway that I used to that was to say, but no, keep writing, even though it's hard, even though words are not coming as easily, your pathway is to keep doing it. My agency was to say, I am able, I am able to cultivate hope in me. And to give you some background and context, just because I, I believe some of you might be struggling with this as well. I struggle with anxiety and I struggle with depression as well. So during a global pandemic, when the world is burning, those were things that were triggered. Those were things that I had to, to process and deal with. Remember, one of the purposes of poetry is to process. So I used my 21 poems to process that. So I'm going to read you one of those poems. And later, after you guys have written your own poems, I'll read you another one. But this one is the very first one of the 21 um, days of poetry. Um, and then after that, I'll give you just um, tips on how to write your own poem. It'll be really quick, like 30 seconds. And then we will close my space of the, the workshop. So this is on Instagram. I posted each poem on Instagram every single day to keep myself accountable um, in my journey to cultivate hope and goodness and, and life in me um, to make sure that, you know, I, I didn't sort of um, lag in that. So this is a short one, day one, tiny tale one of the 21 days of poetry. I really enjoy the famous dude with a sign. Well, I'm a girl and I too am holding on mine. It says hope. Standing up tall and straight, I hold this little big word way above my head. The world is at stake. The fears and facts are causing my arms to shake, but I ignore the desire to buckle in. Lowering the sign will be a betrayal of everything I am made of within. Throughout my life, this word has dragged me from sunrise to sunrise, pushed me from this task to that, preparing me for every conversation, even making sure I'm wearing the right hat. When I beg for rest, hope sparks something new in my chest and we are off again, penning the next poem, planning the next post-lockdown event and finding time to stand still and hold the sign above my head. So grab a marker. Pick a word and make a sign. Stand next to me. Lean this way when your arms get tired because we hold the signs that people are looking for. And that was just my way of saying to the world, listen, I'm choosing hope. It's day one of lockdown, but I'm writing the word hope on a board and I'm going to hold it up for everybody to see, to be like, I believe we can get through this. And these 21 days of poetry was my way. I know my time is up but I'm just going to wrap up quickly. Um, you've learned about the structure, about what the purpose of poetry is, what counts as a poem. I've given you almost a writing prompt in terms of let's write about loss and hope and what have we lost? How are you choosing to continue with hope? Um, and now I'm going to just basically tell you about how to write. So write all of this down or take a picture of, of it if you're not on your phone right now. Um, and it's just a few steps, basically dumping all of your ideas on a page at random. Nothing is good or bad or wrong or right at that stage. Then research. Research by Googling things, Googling concepts, looking at old diaries, reading books, finding out more about what you're writing about. Poetry can be quite an intellectual thing. It's not just something that's inspired from you. Sometimes you, you research and you learn about things. 
then you start writing the actual poem. With writing, you write, you rewrite, you scratch out, you edit, you work on it, you shape it as if you are making a sculpture, you know, you go back and forth on and on and on again, and then you edit. There's a phrase that says you, you, you edit ruthlessly, like you edit without mercy, as you see there in the picture, write without fear, so write freely without insecurities, but edit it ruthlessly, without mercy, like the things that you love in that poem, if it doesn't work, scratch it out. If it doesn't have a place there, scratch it out. You can use it later for another poem. And then you need to get to a stage where you stop. Sometimes some people over edit, sometimes people over rewrite and we're never happy. You need to set a limit for yourself to be like, you know what, once I get to a place that's good enough, I'm going to stop. And if there's more words, more concepts, more ideas bubbling out of you, rather start a new poem. Because the pursuit of perfection sometimes can kill our creativity. And I don't want to do that to you guys, especially at this phase of your life. You guys need to write freely, unapologetically. Your expression needs to be big and loud and confident. And you need to have fun and explore and be curious. So get to a, a space where you stop after a while um, and just enjoy the process. So now you have your writing prompt. Write about hope or write about loss. Even write about both. Um, and I would love you to write the change that you want to see in the world. The world is what you make it, ladies. Um, and each and every one of you are change makers. Each and every one of you are creators and creatives. And I believe you're all writers, whether you're a poet or a creative writer. You are whatever you choose to be. And you are exactly what the world needs at this time. You were born for such a time as this. Entle Masinga wrote, can you let poetry break you? if it will let you deal with what you have neglected. At the center of this question is the meaning of, or not the meaning, it is, it, it's the inquiry of what do we do with our trauma? And we need to be really respectful of trauma. There is a time and a place for poetry to allow us to work through something difficult. In an ideal world, you have an auntie or a grandmother who can, who can hold you when something bad happens, or a mum, and can say, that should never have happened, that was really bad, and, 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 and resources come in for you. But many of us don't get those resources. There isn't somebody standing by to hold us. Maybe there's a school counselor or a therapist that we can go and talk about our troubles or some bad thing that happened. I want to issue a caution about trying to use your writing as your therapy because there, there is a time and a place. But if you're feeling very fragile and you start what we call vomiting onto the page, you can really feel a lot worse. If there's a resource and you can say, maybe it's a minister, maybe it's a, a guidance counselor at the school or a certain teacher that you know just gets you and say, listen, I've been writing this. You know, if you can share it with somebody who, who can help you deal with the situation, then that's, that's great. I can't be prescriptive. When you read a poem, it may make you cry. I think that's a good thing. I think our tears are one of the ways that our nature was created to heal us. You know, have a good blub. And if you can then say, okay, well, now I've cried about that thing. And then you get up and you go to your netball practice or your marimba rehearsal or whatever, you can get on with your life and you can set something aside. But Often, if we've been extremely traumatized, it's, it just can make you feel unraveled and um, you know, in immense distress. So try and bring in resources. And here is one of the suggestions that I have. I'm going to share with you an online document of resources. And one of the, the ways that I believe that we should work with poetry is to create a, a group. You have two or three poetry buddies 
And once a week, you or once a month, you, you set your own schedule that you, you, you get together for half an hour or an hour and you read your poems together. And then in, this, in the context of a group of friends who, who you like, who you trust, you share those poems and let them do their magic. Let them do their healing work. And um, you know then that there are two or three other people who, who can understand something of what you're being through. And, 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 and that is like another safety net. Um, Puno, Kedi, if you want to jump in and say something here, you may have some tips uh, about, yeah, go on, Puno. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I definitely agree with you that we mustn't see poetry as the, the be all and end all, especially when we're processing um, trauma or we're processing, you know, something that's deeply painful. I think the, the, the thing that poetry can, can help do is to help put to words what you're experiencing, especially if it's difficult to do it out loud and face to face. So like you said, if you want to take it to um, your, your guidance counselor or somebody at school or at church or, you know, in your family or whatever, um, it may be an, a, a, a starting point, a tool to be like, this is what I'm experiencing. I'm too shy or too scared to tell you. So here's my poem and maybe you can find me in there. Um, and also to, to enter this question, I definitely believe that yeah, sometimes it, it needs to hurt more before before it gets better, especially if you un, you're unearthing something that you may have experienced or felt a long time ago and haven't addressed. It's going to be painful and that writing process is going to be so and it, it will feel like it's breaking you. Um, and to Liesl's point, Yes, right, and you can do that in a secret place and in, in your own personal space where you feel safe, but make sure you have somebody with you who can help you through the breaking because we don't want you to stay in that broken space. Mm -hmm. We want you to, yes, break so that we know what's there and then you can walk up a path of healing. The, the poetry itself might not do the healing, but the poem is, might be necessary for the process of healing. Um, so, yeah, that's my two cents with that. So the thing is, writing is like, it's like training a muscle. It's like running a marathon. The first day you run, it sucks. And you can feel your skin is on fire. It's itching because all the heat is rising to the surface of your skin. Day two, you feel like you're tasting metal because it, you just can't breathe. But the more and more you run, the more and more it gets easier and gets better, whether it's uphill, downhill, whether it's in rain, whether it's in sun, even though the conditions around you are hot and hard and difficult, because you've trained that muscle over and over again, you've strengthened that muscle and it's easier to get back into it. So the writing for those 21 days during lockdown was probably one of the hardest things I've ever experienced in my life because every day, regardless of whether I felt like it or whether I was feeling inspired or whatever, I needed to to you know, put my running shoes on, my metaphorical running shoes and force myself to get outside and just run until it became natural. So what I'm saying is the more you write, the easier it becomes to write, even when you don't feel like it. And even when you're having a depressive episode or you're having an anxious moment or your emotions are difficult. So if this is something you really do wanna do on a regular basis, I would say write even when you don't feel like it. So number seven is called wait and wonder, wait in the wonder, wait with one another, basically. So I'm trying to think what was seven about. Day seven, I remember this time, everybody was in a state of panic, like, oh my gosh, how am I going to survive? Like 21 days of lockdown, woe is my life. And I think I was struggling because I think a lot of people who were in positions and places of privilege and, you know, they could still afford to buy groceries and whatever. Um, yes, they were struggling emotionally and stuff like that. But I was kind of like, guys, we were going to be okay. Like enjoy the season of not knowing where we're going. And I was frustrated because there's a lot of people who were struggling with like how to really stay alive and to fend for themselves. Um, so it was coming from that place of like, guys, calm down. It's going to be fine. So seven days in, 
calm down, Catherine. You have not reached your breaking point yet. You're actually on the brink of breaking through to something new. So I invite you to throw off the illusion of control and step into surrender. Together, we are learning the anatomy and psychology of a process, how to start and complete things, how to exist in a middle that promises no end. May this limbo teach us to merely exist, to rest, wait and wonder, wait in the wonder, wait with one another. Change is strange, but it happens all the time. Imagine the introduction of clothes. There was a world before democracy. At some point, people genuinely needed their wisdom teeth. Calm the brewing panic in your head, my friend. This process of change will one day end and the next one will certainly begin. Document the metamorphosis. Take note of the evolution. We may never see these versions of ourselves again. Um, so it's now my moment to introduce Katie Borney and Petty to you. She is a creative director, a promo director, a video editor, a copywriter, a scriptwriter, a speaker, and a poet. And I'm really looking forward to her presentation. I've I've had a, a, a heads up and a look at it before, and I'm very excited, particularly by the imagery she chose, which I think will speak to all of you. Kitty, over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, guys. Um, the last time we saw each other, it was right before lockdown, and since then. Um, like Puno, myself, I had time to reflect and, you know, get to know myself, sit down, write my poems. And I just have one that I want to share that was inspired by that time. So I'm going to go straight right into it, right? It's called The 21st Century Beyond the 21 Days. As the age of revolution starts its clock, you, the children of this time, are the drivers of its evolution. Since you write the lines that form your flesh and skin, offer good vibes and take care of your kin. The heritage of the human species is forever unfolding. It's writing life species. And in our book of revelations, the main character declares, there is no regress, only progress. The villain is attempting to create deserts. We confront it with an oasis we use to wash our hands. We yearned to order out and had nothing but our minds to put in order. Outside had many empty spaces, but our hearts had something to offer. Confused with the laws that change faces, outraged with invisible debates made in our fate. If the viral symptoms of this virus is that we shut down the times we have to laugh over food and wine, then the antidote is to make it wonder how do we still smile? Show off the eternity of our soul stability, found in the simplicity of mankind's originality, ingenuity, and creativity. When there are no visitors at the door, making us feel more lonely than ever before, we look for clues that take us out of these blues. We lose the norm, but we find ourselves. We are the 21st century living beyond the 21 days. We overcame a time when every day, felt like a Sunday. Hi guys, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna switch to my presentation and hopefully I inspire you and I connect with you, right? I wanna say to you guys, thank you so much for being here. But more importantly, thank you so much for choosing to be here. We are a reflection of the choices that we make. We are products of choice, we are a manifestation of choices. And while you guys could have been anywhere, you chose to be here today, sharing with us, with, this, with your time, your, your energy, your creativity, your positivity, and your receptivity. And for that, I thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to join me in an understanding. I want you guys to share this idea with me. And I heard you talk about whether you are valid enough to be poets or you feel good enough to be poet. And the idea that I want us to share and agree upon is that it is enough. You are enough. Some of you have hope in poetry. Some of you believe in poetry. Some of you 
have poetry as hobbies and interests, I want us to agree that the hope, the belief, the interest that you have is enough. I want us to agree that you are enough. Because no matter where you are in your poetry journey, before there were poet laureates, before there were Nobel Peace Prize winning poets, before Puno was a Puno, there was the hope, the belief, and the interest in poetry. So you are enough. It is enough. Whatever it is that you bring to the table, it is enough. Most importantly, you should be able to see yourself reflected in other poets because you share in the same journey. So, yes, the concept of the fact that we are enough, whatever it is that we bring to the table, no matter where we are in our poetry journey, it is enough. And we need to agree. And I want us to be able to address each other as fellow poets, because I do believe that I am in the presence of other poets. Now, what I'm going to talk about is the big picture, the understanding that we have to choose love. We have so many choices. We have so many options. And as a poet, what I can ask all of you is, what is a poet without love? Love is this universal energy that connects us all. It is the energy that creates worlds. It is the energy, the thing that we look for, we yearn for, we sing about, we write about it, we share so many stories about it. If you go on TV, there's so many shows that are written about love. And even now, I'm still sharing to you about love, and it's still not enough. There's still so much to write about it. It's one of the themes in the Avbop Poetry Competition. And the reason why I choose love is because I've seen with my own self, when I choose or I take a stance that is more of love, then I have a lot more to offer. I want to be able to offer a lot more. And I want to be able to speak as a poet from a perspective of love, from an intention of love. The thing that I value the most is the poets themselves. The poets themselves is what I will be looking at and exploring in terms of my presentation. And I want us to, in as much as we appreciate poetry as a platform, to look and dive into the poet. What does it mean to be a poet? A poet is defined as a creator, a maker, one who uses imaginative innovation to create. A poet is also defined as a composer, an author. Now, the first definition draws me into poetry because it tells me that a poet is one who uses imagination and innovation to create, a maker. And I've always defined poetry myself as the bridge between what we think and what we feel. And while I appreciate imagination, I feel so comfortable connecting that definition with an understanding that when you are a poet, you connect how you feel with what you think. There is so much value in being a poet. There is so much value within yourself that you have to offer and find within yourself to give. The concept of value to me says that you have to find what is in you first before you can give it to the world. Now, one of my favorite writers, his name is Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer, in one of his lectures, he shared this analogy. He said, if I wanted to give you oranges, I'd have to first have those oranges. I'd have to first find those oranges in order to be able to give you. If I wanted to share with you insights and experiences, thoughts and ideas, poems, I'd have to find the poetry from inside of me. If I cannot find it in me, then I cannot offer you. The people that have hate to give to this world, the people that don't offer love, the people that offer fear and the things that we might not want as a society do so because they do not have love to offer. And to me, one of the most important messages that I've had is Kitty, remember that you have to find value within yourself. You have to find the insights within yourself in order to share them with the rest of the world. And I find that you give and get what you are from this world. The next idea 
that I have is the fact that no matter where you are in your poetry journey, when you can introspect and inspect what values you believe in, you will always find that there's a poem inside of you to share. And it doesn't necessarily have to be structured. You do not necessarily have to be a practiced and acknowledged poet in order to share that. We share that in the most simplest of ways. And the most simplest of ways is amongst ourselves, with our friends, with our families. At the end of the day, the results that you receive are the ones that we give from inside of you. That is a quick introduction into these four slides of my presentation or conversation, rather. I'm going to share a poem with you guys. Loving myself is the simplest revolution I've ever had. It's a silent, small protest. It started small, silent, like, shh. No one noticed I was drinking more water, breathing deeper and slower. I said I was going outside to get some water, but really, I was distancing myself from all the gossips. I felt as though my ears deserved to hear better and my eyes wanted to see better. My mind finally joined my senses and I could distance myself from the noises. I could distance myself from the harsh rush of today and find a holiday. And in that holiday, I could hear my heart beat. Listen. Speak, explore, understand. It beats, relax, breathe, walk, laugh, relate, connect, heal. Loving myself is the simplest revolution I've ever had. Speaks about the formula that I use in order to connect with poetry and write poetry. I identify more, and I know that there are structures that are given and prescribed that tell us that we can use rhythm and metaphors and structure and pacing and all of those things. But I identify more with being authentic to who I am. When I dissect or go into writing a poem, I check with my emotions, I check with my senses, I align with my vision. I look into my culture and I set an intention. Now we've embraced this cold culture of not being emotional. And it seems as though sometimes when somebody says, you're being too emotional, it's like an, an insult. They're you know, trying to point out the fact that you might be irrational. As a poet, I implore you, to accept and embrace being emotional because that is where you come from. How you feel is how you express yourself. And it does not have to be cold and rigid and structured. Express yourself just how you feel and that is okay. It is okay to be emotional. And most importantly, you can also respond to people that say, you're too emotional with, yes, I am poetically emotional. I connect with my heart. That is how I express my mind, with my emotions. The senses. Um, Virginia Woolf, like one of my favorite poets, is Virginia Woolf. And she was probably one of the best poets that could articulate, dissect, you know, ideas with sound and sight and touch and feel, all of those things. These are the things that I also connect with. When I write a poem, I go into the senses, breaking them down, looking at the sun, breaking down the rays of the sun, connecting with sound. How does something sound and expressing it from that perspective? So it's one of um, a, a, a skilled um, attributes. And I think we all need one and as, as poets. But even if you are not that skilled in it, it's still fine. The vision. When I talk about vision, guys, I remember a poem about, it's not a, it's a, a poem from, in, mm, a poem from Nelson Mandela. He made it famous. It's called Invictus. When Invictus ends, it says, 
I am the captain of my ship. I am the master of my fate. But it doesn't start from that perspective. It starts with out of the night that covers me. So when Invictus begins, it's from a different perspective. The writer is not in an empowered space. But when it ends, it ends with, I am the captain of my ship, I am the master of my fate, which is something that speaks to vision. When you write your poems, it is, it is, it is helpful to come from a perspective where you can envision where you are and where you want to be by the end of that poem. The next one is culture. I am, I'm from Orlando West, you guys know. I come from a culture of township. I come from a culture of richness. I come from a very history-filled culture. And it, it, it is one that I appreciate. But I recently learned, I learned that where I'm from, Orlando West, the most famous street, Vilagazi Street, is named after Dr. Vilagazi, who was the first black uh, professor somebody to, the first black person to get a PhD. And his culture, I'm going to put it like that, his culture was be educated, get an education. That was his thing for his people. That is what he wanted to share. That was his legacy. And so when I reflect on culture, I always think from a perspective of what is it that I want to leave behind? What is it that I am living? What is it that I'm preaching? Something that I connect with deeply is the idea of humanity. I connect with the idea that we are human beings. And at the base of who we are, how we treat each other, it's meant to be humane. Then there's intention. Intention is a formula to me because you don't always find yourself in a good space. You don't always find yourself in a positive space. You don't always find yourself, like you were saying, you, you're, you're, there's pain, there's trauma. But what is it that you intend as a poet? What is the value that you want to share with the rest of the world? So introspecting on intention, giving yourself a moment of silence and authentically connecting with what is it that you intend is so important. And I value that when I find it from someone who's sharing a poem, from someone who's, who's a poet, when I can see that they intended on sharing something that will uplift or empower me. And you can feel it. You can always feel it. At the end of the day, we are poets. We are creatures of feeling. We are creatures of imagination. And that, those are the things that we essentially end up connecting with. I have reached a point in my life where I can narrate almost everything that happens to me as a spoken word. Almost everything that happens to me, I narrate it as a spoken word. Life is but a spoken word says to me, the metaphors, the rhythms, the similes, the personifications, all of the technical things that you find are described to you in poetry, I can find them in my own life. And I feel and I can identify with the fact that I am more so a poet because of these things. Not so much because I've mastered being able to break down a metaphor, but more so because I can find it within myself. I can compare myself to something from nature, a tree. I can compare myself to something in real life and an experience. So whenever I find how I try to identify myself as a poet, I look at the, the, the structures, the rhythms, the, the similes, like I said, the alliterations and all of that. And I can connect with them from a personal, personal space. I think that you are always going to be in a space where you write, not necessarily thinking of the technical aspects of poetry, or even if you are in that space, but the most authentic poetry always comes from where you are in your headspace at a, at a specific time. But you can be able to create poetry, like find the rhythms, find the rhymes, from how you identify with the rhythms and the rhymes. Like my daily routine is a rhythm and a rhyme, so it's easy for me to just rhyme and connect with a poem and write a poem and speak about a poem. So yes, that's what I mean by 
life is but a spoken word. Next. Those unspoken things. Poetry gives us such an opportunity to bring out of the shadows the things that are heavy, things that are very heavy. I am not unique in my experience of experiencing heaviness. I'm not unique in a life that has had pain. And art has pain. But what I find to be redeeming for me is understanding that there's no amount of shame or guilt that is worth me limiting myself. Mm. I cannot step back and not live my life because of the things that have happened to me, the things that are part of my history, the things that have been happening as I grew up as a child. My poetry is redefining what those things are to me. And we have them. All of us have them. We have shadows that keep us from doing the things that we want to do. More, in, more, more crippling, actually. The shadows and the guilt and the shames and all those things, they keep us from expressing ourselves. They keep us from even saying or expressing things because, wait, I have to think I'm not good enough. Or, wait, this happened to me. I'm not relating. Or, I went to this. I might not be able to connect or I might not be on the same, same pedestal as the people that are the ones that everybody looks up to. And I feel very much that the first step towards reconciling that is having the honors and the bravery and the courage to speak them out. Speak them out. We say poetry is a spoken word. We write poetry. From the moment you write poetry, you are speaking, you are journaling your experience, you are saying how you feel, you are bringing it out. Never hold any form of shame or guilt or think that it is a definition of who you are. I spoke about this the last time we, we were together. I said, we are human beings. That's what we are. A human being is a human becoming. We are not is, we are not done. We are unfolding. And as we unfold, we are going to misstep and we are going to mistake. That does not make us the mistake. That does not make us the misstep. That is not who we are. But we can take from that the greatest values and kill it. We can shine. We can inspire. I think for me, the most healing experiences and the most healing times have been when I've had shared insight with someone, when someone has shared their story with me and I can relate and think, oh, I went through that too. You know, shared insight heals. So make no mistake, use your poetry, use your poems, use that, your experiences to help someone. I, I think I'm not even immune at this stage in my life from being assisted. I'm still very much open and you can inspire me with your poems. Next is, I believe, the poets of today. We are the poets of today. What I've experienced or what, what I've seen uh, in my life ever since I, I've lived full-time. Um, yeah, full-time as a poet. I identify my name is Silvoni, I'm a poet. I've had the opportunity to be a narrator, a speaker, I have had the opportunity to be invited to places where they just ask me to share and inspire and to connect with other people. So as Puno was saying, the poets of today, we have, we have, we have evolved, right? Back in the day, uh, a poet laureate, somebody who was appointed by a governor or whatever, th those were the poets, they were the historians, they were the, the prophets and all of that. Today, it's us with the podcasts. It's us with the comments, it's us with the, the social analysis. So don't limit yourself in terms of thinking of how you are a poet based on what you perceive or what has been defined as poet. If you are a person that can, like I said, connect with your imagination and how you feel and have a spoken word, then you are a poet of today. When you are invited to have or add commentary on 
social issues or social ills, you are being a poet. You get to narrate the story of today. So, yes, I've had the chance to do so much of that. I remember I was, in, I was invited to, and I don't know who, who made that mistake. I was invited to speak at a, a men's conference for gender-based violence. And what they had asked is that, uh, come and address, they, they, they issued the invite to Kilibon the poet, come and address or speak on behalf of women to a group of men. And I thought to myself, is this me trying to make men understand what it's like to be a woman or what? And I, I honestly could not come up with anything. By the time I was there, I was on stage speaking from my heart, my experiences as a woman. And I said so much. I, I just, yes, that was my job. And that for me was another moment of poetry. So yes, guys, um, we are the writers. We are the speakers, we are the analysts, we are the thought leaders, we are the community, the parents, the sisters, all of that. It's, it's in every one of those times, we have an opportunity to be poet. The beauty of mankind cannot be sanitized, neutralized, or put in disguise. This day, is taking a fresh breath, connecting men to S, distancing itself from stress. Life will suffer no shutdown, melt down to no tomorrow, bow down to COVID sorrow. History pages will write as follows. We did it. We supported the effort of hope. With our palms sweating, we hung on tight to the rope. And now it's being reported, yesterday's giant is no more. Yeah, definitely. We come from a culture that has embraced academia for a very long time. But I think the evidence is there, Amokhelang. Amokhel, yeah, Amokhelang. The evidence is there. We've had situations where in the past, if you say you want to become uh, an artist or anything, I also, for example, I studied accounting. I left and I went into writing. So First, before I got into writing, I was intimidated. I thought if I wanted to get jobs in this field, I would definitely not be good enough. So I, I looked for something. I got an opportunity to study writing. And I learned once I was inside that the perspective that I'd had for so many years, I grew up thinking if you're not a, a doctor and all of that, was not true. I learned that the world is big. The world is big, and artists, more, more now than, than ever before, are the ones that are taking us forward. We, we come from a time where we've had lockdown and things have shut down. The creatives, the people who, like me, video editing briefs have come from so many places, and you know, creating ideas, being a creative has been something that has kept me going in these times. So. I would say that don't think of it from a perspective of I'm going to be a starving artist. And while that is a legit concern to have, you won't be. You will not be. There, there is work. And when there isn't work, you can create work for yourself. I think also Puno can help with, with, with that question. Absolutely. I just want to um, add on to what um, Giddy said there, um, that it, we saw that during lockdown, that a lot of people were losing jobs, but funny enough, the creatives were the ones needed. Um, more As much as we lost jobs in the beginning, during, people were like, we need people to inspire our employees, or, you know, now everything's gone online, how, how do we do the video editing, we need voiceovers, we need all of these different things, we... We need dancers to do a whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, so artists are always going to be necessary. We've seen that throughout the ages, from whether you're speaking ancient Egypt, whether you're speaking Greek, myth Greek mythology, all the way to now 21st century life. So we will always be necessary. Added to that, though, just remember that as much as you're not going to be a starving artist, 
it is difficult. So it's not impossible, but it is bloody tough. <laughs> That's the only way I can put it. So my advice to you would be st- be strategic about it and have a plan. So just like Gidi, I also studied something else before becoming a full-time sort of writer and poet. I studied law and I finished it and I didn't go into articles. I didn't do all of the things, but I always laugh and I tell people that it's easier for people to trust Um, a poet with a law degree than it is to just trust a poet because they're like oh at least you know she she's 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 not playing around she has some sense in her mind or she you know she's shown that 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 there's a sort of I don't know how to put it she's worked hard at a specific thing I don't know it impresses people for whatever reason Um, and it's also given me a language I can speak to corporates I can speak to people who are in those different spaces because I always say traditional work environments need creatives and creatives need traditional work environments it's a collaboration that needs to happen but that means strategy you need to think of okay where are the gaps is it in their marketing strategies is it in their internal comms is it do i want to be on a theater stage all of these things and then have a plan and it might mean for some time you are living two different lives for for very long before i freelanced i had to have full-time jobs and i was working and i was writing and doing other things at night and whatever until i could get to the point where i could support myself So don't just be like, oh, I'm quitting my job. or I'm like dropping out of school and becoming a writer. It's not going to work. You have to have a plan. And then you'll get to a point where you work long and hard enough so that you can, you know, you can establish yourself. Um, So it's not impossible. It is tough, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. My experience is that the poems that speak straight to your heart that really resonate with you, what they'll have in common is the words that you need to hear here and now. So for example, Kitty's poem, Look at Me. It's, which of us has not wanted to be seen? Which of us has not felt ignored and disrespected? So her poem there is saying, me, here, look, me, I'm here, I'm here, look at me. And so it speaks to each one of us that's wanting to claim the space. And it should hopefully encourage you to write your own look at me poem or hear me or give me space or um, whatever the, the, the key message word that comes through. There are genres in poetry. I think for me, I'll find more the metaphysics to be the ones that I relate most to because they speak to the things that I relate to personally. But it's very subjective. There is no objective prescription in poetry that's like the best ones have these in common. I've read um, the ones that get Pulitzer Prizes, and the one thing that they seem to have is a theme of analyzing situations that a great number of people can relate to. They have a a theme, a theme that speaks to a lot of people and an art in them, like the words that they use, the tones, the structures, the rhymes. And yeah, I think though, when it comes to which poems are the most, you know, I think it's it's very, very subjective. My answer simply is what makes a successful poem is when a poem achieves the objective that it was written for, it is successful. And when it, that comes across clearly, not just to the author themselves, but to anybody who reads it. And like he said, if it resonates um, with many people, that's probably really successful. So if the object, the object or rather the purpose of the poem, objective of the poem was to build, was to break, was to heal, was to express, was to whatever. If it achieves that well and clearly, it's a successful poem. The poem that I wrote for you guys is In Honor of the Self. It reads, Inverted sights, look at me not just with your eyes, but in every fiber of your being. Look at me with your heart's intention. Look at me with your mind's openness. Look at me with the fine lines in your handprints. For I, just like you, am one in a trillion. Let your eyes speak the truth that I am neither nose or hair, Eyes or skin, 
I am a whole self. I am a whole vibration. I am the vibe. This is my energy. Look at me with the truth of your mind. Look at me with the truth of your heart. Inverted sides, look at me. I am the vibe. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. And thank you for letting us see you and listen to your poetry. That was a, a terrific gift that you've brought us today. This is called Puno's Silver Linings Playbook. So there's a movie called Silver Linings Playbook um, where basically it's like, these are the rules to overcoming hard things in life. And this was my rule book in when I'm in a place of whether it's anxiety, whether it's a depressive episode, whether it's just tough, it's just tough in life. This is my playbook. This is my rule book to get me to the other side. Um, and maybe this could be your playbook too. Puno Silver Linings playbook to be used during tough times. Number one, hope. You need it. You have it. You may not always understand it, but it is there. Number two, do not stare too long at the clock. Time is not in your hands. It is, something, it is not something to control, but there are other things that you can. So use your energy on those. Number three, keep friends and family close. Not too close because you know COVID. Number four, cry. When the tears come, cry. Number five, pray. Number six, read your Bible daily with coffee. Number seven, sing and worship your lungs out. What are the neighbors going to do? Come to your door and shout at you? No, they're not really allowed to. Number eight, you need nature, oxygen and the sky. So if you're stuck in the house, stick your head out. Number nine, sis, exercise. Number 10, time to discover your own magic. There is plenty of it to be found. Thank you, ladies, for being in this workshop. And thank you for having me. And thank you to Bob and to Liesl and to Gidi and to Oleg and to everybody. And that is it for me. This is a poem called How to Be a Poet, to remind myself. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. You must depend on affection, reading, knowledge, skill more of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience. For patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. Breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate Slowly, live a three-dimensioned life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it, of the little words that come out of the silence like prayers, prayed back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. Be bold, be brave, write on, and love yourself. Love what you are saying and be kind. I think that's all from me. You'll get your certificates of participation and you should now get your gifts as well. And I look forward to seeing your poems in the years to come. I'm sure we have some winners here. Be well. <laughs>